21st of February 2011, uh, Tamils Against Genocide, a US-based legal advocacy group, and Swiss Council of Erlem Tamils, a democratically elected uh, Tamil body in Europe, will be submitting a complaint to the International Criminal Court under Article 15. Uh, my name is Rajiv Sridharan. I am the lead legal analyst and also satellite image analyst for uh, Tamils Against Genocide, or TAG. Uh, joining me is Ladin Sundaralingam. Uh, he is a member of Luzern State Parliament in Switzerland. Uh, he also is a political advisor for uh, the Swiss Council of Erdem Tamils, uh, otherwise known as SCET. Also joining me is Dr. Sam Parry, a spokesperson and member of the Australian Tamil Congress of War Crimes Inquiry Team. And we are all here to uh, discuss how we prepare this submission and what we anticipate in the coming months. Uh, the, the reason that we decided to uh, to initiate fact-finding and evidence collection efforts to support this submission uh, was a reaction to the general neglect that we've seen from the international community regarding uh, counter-terrorism uh, combat zones after 9-11. The submission uh, alleges that uh, dual national uh, dual national Palita Kohana, who is a Australian and Sri Lankan national, uh, participated uh, directly or indirectly in the extrajudicial killing of three LTT members after they had surrendered by waving a white flag on the 18th of May 2009 uh, in territories close to the safe zone. The LTT members uh, were, were had names uh, Nadesen, Pulitevin, and Ramesh. It's important to note that uh, Ramesh was the chief of the Tamil Erlam police and not uh, the uh, lead commander for the Batiklo region. The, the reason that we are uh, submitting this request to the International Criminal Court are, uh, have, have multiple grounds. Uh, for one, uh, the Tamil diaspora is uh, dissatisfied with the, the, the history of Tamil justice in Sri Lanka in general. And the LLRC, the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission in Sri Lanka, we believe that after at least 40,000 deaths, 30,000 disabled, and a generation of widows, orphans, um, that a retributive post-conflict justice mechanism is what is necessary. And just mere truth-finding will not suffice. Uh, the, the, the geostrategic environment which... Uh, we work in is quite complicated. After 9-11, uh, the war on terror has also, in parallel, waged a war on the enforcement of customary norms of international humanitarian law. So, uh, things from killing civilians to, in, in this case, uh, murdering uh, combatants after they have surrendered by waving a white flag, in the contemporary context, uh, do not violate uh, international humanitarian law. So th this is the main reason that uh, we have chosen to engage the International Criminal Court uh, directly. Uh, our general policy is uh, you know, engagement without dependency, that we encourage the United Nations and the international human rights community in general to investigate into the crimes that were committed during the last half of the war. But we believe in parallel that the scenario where uh, the Tamil uh, diaspora, the Tamils in Sri Lanka, are denied uh, the justice which they deserve. Um, that is a non-negotiable uh, end result, that there will be Tamil justice in some form. The second point that is relevant is, uh, this, this filing is, on one level, the first uh, attempt by the Sri Lankan Tamil community since independence to exercise the option of pursuing international justice. Uh, prior to this attempt, the attempts to enforce uh, violations of law against uh, Tamil civilians, uh, in many cases uh, violated by the state, uh, have, have been suppressed inside Sri Lanka or in South Asia in general. Uh, if you go to Tamil Nadu, there are over 200,000 Sri Lankan Tamil civilians living as refugees without a path to citizenship, 
Uh, in recent months, we have seen the Sri Lankan Navy attack the Tamil Nadu fishermen in southern India. So this general problem of how do you create a justice process uh, is, is the main reason that we have not seen uh, any meaningful effort to enforce Tamil justice at present. Die heutige Situation stellt eine große Herausforderung für die tamilische Diaspora dar, weil die Sri Lankanische Regierung weigert eine internationale Kriegsverbrechenuntersuchung. Und das stoßt die tamilische Diaspora noch eine innere größere äh, Verpflichtung rein, damit wir als äh, zweite Generation der tamilischen Gemeinschaft hier aktiv werden. Was wir machen können, ist nicht auf die internationale Gerichtsbarkeit zu warten, sondern auf nationaler Ebene in den Ländern, wo die Tamilen leben, versuchen, einen juristischen Weg auf den Weg zu begleiten. Aus diesen Gründen haben wir auch äh, versucht, jetzt gegen Palita Kohana, weil er zwei äh, Doppelbürger ist, Australien und Sri Lankanische Pass hat, gegen ihn im internationalen Gerichtshof eine Klage einzureichen, damit der ähm, Ankläger dort ähm, Palita Kohana in Verantwortung ziehen kann. Und was die Wichtigste da, dabei ist, dass die Tamilsprechenden, vor allem die zweite Generation, in ihre, auf nationaler Ebene versuchen, die, das Kriegsverbrechen, was gegen Tamilen in Sri Lanka passiert ist, zu beweisen und auf dem juristischen Weg ähm, die Sri Lankanische Regierung in Verantwortung zu ziehen. Um, this submission uh, plays an important role with regards to uh, upholding human rights in Australia. Um, one of the main um, alleged perpetrators in the submission is Palita Kohona, who is a dual Sri Lankan Australian citizen. And um, something else that's quite interesting is that he also um, held uh, a, f a senior official post um, with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So in some instances you can look at this as not just as an Australian citizen who had potentially committed a war crime, uh, but also a, a former senior official who worked with the Australian Defence and um, Trade Ministry uh, who has potentially um, committed a war crime. Since the since Australia is a signatory to the Rome Statute, um, this submission, one of the questions this submission raises is really will Australia assert its jurisdiction over, over this crime? Um, you know, it raises the question of whether, uh, what really is Australia's policy on war crimes committed by uh, naturalised Australian citizens? And furthermore, it, there's also um, a, a grey area, or, or rather, uh, a serious question that's being raised where can things just be brushed under the carpet because war crimes have been committed by Sri Lankan citizens and Sri Lanka does not want to pursue um, finding, uh, bringing them to justice. But when crimes are committed by dual citizens, then does Australia also have a responsibility to ensure that um, perpetrators who are their own citizens are brought to justice? Right, and to actually build on that point, uh, if we look at the South Asia region and the ability to enforce violations of international criminal law from the International Criminal Court, which is in The Hague, down to Colombo, you have essentially a zone of impunity because there is no regional court. And Sri Lanka says it has not signed the Rome Statute. Therefore, it has some sort of positive right to uh, you know, commit these violations of international humanitarian law. And so with no regional court in South Asia, you have the International Criminal Court, and then you have the Sri Lanka National Court. And so if both are saying there's no jurisdiction, then it basically creates a zone of regional impunity in South Asia where international humanitarian law can be violated and there are no consequences. So that, that builds on the point that you made, uh, Dr. Sam, with regards to uh, Palita Kohana's a dual nationality and how this actually, you know, this war crime with regards to the three LTT members who were killed after waving a white flag, you know, now Australia is on some level possibly implicated in this war crime based on uh, Kohana's nationality. Yes, and 
this submission and the information in this submission that's been um, uh, put forth to the International Criminal Court also opens the door for us in Australia as Australian citizens to prosecute Kohona in um, Australian courts. We have uh, many Australian citizens, Tamil citizens, who have lost their loved ones and their relatives um, in, uh, in, in the war um, due to war crimes perpetrated by the Sri Lankan government. Uh, we have eyewitnesses in Australia who have seen um, war crimes committed um, and who will be able to give evidence. Uh, so this submission, although it's taking place on an international level and the submission is being made in Europe, it really does open the door for us in Australia to um, to uh, to put forth um, a, a submission in Australian courts. And, and in some ways it will also test if, Austra if the Australian government is willing to uh, pursue and investigate crimes of this nature um, against uh, potential or alleged war criminals who are Australian citizens because history has shown us that um, to some extent Australia has been quite reluctant to uh, prosecute alleged war criminals or rather investigate um, alleged war criminals um, who either reside in Australia or who are citizens of Australia um, since the end of World War. Um, so the it's it's quite um, it is it is in some ways it will test where Australia stands, but it also opens the door for um, some type of uh, attaining some kind of closure for victims and their families of um, of war crimes in Sri Lanka. Right. And and two other features of our approach in the submission. Uh, one is that the historical methods used to suppress uh, initiatives for Tamil justice in Sri Lanka. Uh, is inapplicable to this method because uh, it, th this is initiated by the, the global Tamil diaspora, which has always been the sleeping giant in this equation for Tamil justice. Uh, it's one thing to bomb uh, the Vanni region or murder journalists in Colombo, which has the consequences of uh, deterring efforts to enforce basic Tamil civil liberties in Sri Lanka. However, if this movement is uh, initiated from the diaspora, it's essentially immune to the tactics of the, the Sri Lankan government, which has been used in the past. Uh, the, and the second feature is, since, uh, and I, I had touched on this earlier, that after 9-11, we have seen basically uh, the death of the liberal doctrine of uh, humanitarian intervention. We, we saw this in multiple countries, uh, even East Timor, uh, Sierra Leone, we can go to a post-conflict justice initiatives in Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Cambodia, uh, in Latin America in the 70s. The list goes on. Uh, but you know, this pattern has ended after 9-11. And so now the prospect of Tamil justice on some level that presumably is in the hands of the United Nations, uh, international human rights groups, uh, big powers. And if you look at similar violations, in other nations, such as Congo, Burma, Ethiopia, the civilian populations there who have suffered the same sort of crimes uh, basically are plagued by the same circumstance that everyone is waiting for the international community to come and support the justice system. So on, on the other level, we are basically attempting to circumvent this trend and create a new model to enforce uh, justice for violations after violence. Um, I think it's also quite important to mention that um, this ICC submission is uh, one of the first of many submissions that are going to take place. Um, it also uh, is a symbol of the coordinated um, step being taken by the Tamil um, diaspora and especially the, the younger generation who are um, really uh, stepping up and rather than waiting for um, the international community to do something and, and give the Tamil people the much-deserved justice. 